mom driving down right. the road. Right, yeah. yeah. But, and if, if it's, in my mind, if it was somebody who was looking on the road, who's not familiar with church, after about four minutes listening to singing, they're probably like, oh, I'm going to go to the next meeting. Right. Yeah. And then maybe if you get to the meet of it, it might. It was just something I was thinking about. That's not a bad idea. 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 And if you just put it down to the people who want to hear the singing in the whole service, they can just watch it. It ain't, it ain't making you skip. That's right. I can do that. Actually. Welcome, everybody. Glad to see everybody here. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started, especially since we got the business meeting coming up. And we want to make sure we get through this. And I have a feeling y'all are going to have a lot of questions, as, as I did. Uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we, uh, we come together today, as we have every week in this series, wanting to learn more about the other religions around us so that we may reach them where they are. Paul teaches us that we need to, to go and be for everyone else what they are first so that we can then bring them to the truth of the, the life, deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray that this, uh, this message today or this, this teaching today would help to edify us that we may worship and serve you better through Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah. All right, so let's get started here. Um, I'm gonna tell you this is uh, this was a challenging one for me. Um, we're gonna be talking about Scientology today, and uh, Scientology is what I would definitely uh, refer to as a destructive cult. Now, up to this point, we have been talking about uh, Christian cults. Christian cults are different because they are heresies outside of the norm of teaching of Christianity. But a destructive cult is more like what we think of when we think of the cult that was with um, uh, Manson in, in, the, in California in the, what was it, 1960s, 70s, 60s? Um, but it definitely uh, goes under the, the, the definition that's put forth by the American Psychological Association, which is the destructive cult is an authoritarian regime which uses deception when recruiting, as well as mind control techniques to make a person dependent and obedient. And let me tell you, Scientology meets every single word of that. Now, understand, just like we've talked about with everything, we're talking about Scientology, the group, the organization, the religion. But I, what I would encourage us all to do is the thing that I have to remind myself to do is that we're not out there to win arguments. We're out there to win souls to Christ. And we're not going to do that by, by beating people down in terms of verbally winning arguments. And like, like we've said before, the, uh, the Bible actually teaches that there's going to be all of this. There's going to be false Christs, false gods, uh, false angels, false spirits, false prophets, and, and all of those would be true in this case. Now, this is a slide that I took from our Christian cults uh, one, but in many ways it still uh, applies to the Church of Scientology um, in, in that there is always addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division when you talk about a, a cult. So, uh, of course... One of the interesting things about Scientology is they don't necessarily say that you have to leave your other faiths. Like you don't necessarily have to get rid of your you know, Christian beliefs, um, just that you have to add ours, right? And then, um, of course, there's subtraction. And in, in the case of Scientology, they subtract virtually everything there is to subtract out of Christianity. Then they, of course, multiply what you've got to do in order to attain salvation or nirvana or whatever. And then in the case of Scientology, there's a ton of division, specifically division in terms of dividing families, dividing loved ones. And we'll talk about that toward the end of the talk. There is, now you want to talk about doctrinal ambiguity. I was telling Pastor Todd, I, I probably spent between 30 and 40 hours preparing for tonight's talk because it is so convoluted and complex and hard to understand and most of what they, the, the big church of Scientology believes is not even taught to Scientologists until they reach what they call OT3 level. Um, it, it is extremely complicated and convoluted. Um, not so much in the way of false prophecies, uh, but there's definitely violation of sound rules of every reason that you can possibly imagine. And then their semantics are unbelievably difficult to um, to interpret. Now, uh, there is a chapter in Kingdom of the Cults 
A lot of what you are going to see today is actually taken directly from their website, which is one of the most beautiful, well done, every one of them has a video popping up website. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. Of course, they're a multi-billion dollar corporation um, where they take whole lots of their um, parishioners' money. Um, and then a lot of it also comes from this book. This guy, Chris Shelton, spent 30 years including about 20 years in the Sea Org, which is like the highest level um, organization. It's a paramilitary organization within Scientology. And he ultimately ended up leaving um, not all that long ago, about three or four years ago. And he, he uh, wrote this book called Scientology A to Xenu. And then I highly, highly, highly recommend that you watch this series. There's three seasons already. Uh, of it. It's uh, Leah Remini and Mike Render. Mike Render was essentially the number two in Scientology and finally left due to a lot of the abuses that were going on in the church. So let's talk about it. Who founded Scientology? L. Ron Hubbard. I remember growing up in the in the 80s and you'd see commercials, right? Dianetics by L. Ron Hubbard, you know, and it, I mean, it's very pretty and well done and everything. He was born in Nebraska in 1911. Um, and this is what the, the Church of Scientology says about him. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, uh, but there are some incredible um, claims here. Uh, he, he, here's one of them. L. Ron Hubbard became the first to scientifically isolate, measure, and describe the human spirit while objectively demonstrating spiritual potentials well in advance of scientific thought. Moreover, those potentials were found to be possessed by every human being and just as universally attainable thus developed his description of Scientology as accomplishing the goal of every great religion, freeing the soul by wisdom. Now, there's so many things wrong with what they say about him there. First of all, the goal of every religion is not freeing the soul by wisdom. That's not the goal of Christianity, and it's certainly not the goal of most of the things that we've talked about. But uh, needless to say, basically, L. Ron Hubbard is he, all of his writings, and he, if he is nothing else, he was a very prolific writer, thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. It is claimed that he actually wrote the book Dianetics in three weeks. And based on how many volumes of stuff he put out, that's, I, I couldn't believe that's probably a true statement. Um, but it, his writings are basically considered scripture, infallible scripture to a Scientologist. So you just have to understand that right up front. Uh, he actually started his career as a science fiction writer, where he literally was getting paid a penny a word for his writings. Um, now, the first thing you need to know about L. Ron Hubbard is that the guy was a pathologic liar. I mean, there's just, it's demonstrably true that the man was a pathologic liar. As an example, at one point he claimed to be a nuclear physicist. Well, now he did start college in nuclear physics, uh, but then dropped out of school because he basically failed out. Um, he claimed to be a war hero in the Navy. And so a lot of the, if you, if you watch anything about Scientology, you'll hear a lot of Navy terms uh, thrown around. Uh, and he actually uh, claimed that he was the Commodore of the Sea Org. Um, which, if you don't know Navy ranks, Commodore is the highest of the admirals. Um, the truth of the matter is he commanded two, but he was in the Navy, and he was an officer, and he was, uh, was actually the captain of two different small boats. Uh, he was a complete disaster as a captain, and he actually at one point mistakenly uh, lobbed some bombs at Mexico. Um, but the whole war hero thing, complete garbage. Um, he also had a lot of claims about his naval history where he was, uh, he said he was, he was injured and near death and all this kind of stuff that he was uh, blinded at one point, all of which was completely false, 100% false. Um, but the biggest thing in terms of religion is, is he ultimately claimed to be the fulfillment of a 2,500-year-old Buddhist prediction about the Maitreya, uh, Maitreya, which was like a second coming of Buddha, basically. So he claimed he was the Maitreya. Um, and much of his teachings and stuff do come out of, and this is, why, this is why I ultimately put this one this week instead of last week, is that a lot of his teachings do come out of kind of Eastern thought. Um, there's a lot of Hinduism, Buddhism, like thinking in it. Um, he was married three times, the second one, while he was still married to the first. 
Um, he, so he was a, a bigamist. Um, interestingly enough, when he got upset with his wife, at, his second wife at one point, he actually kidnapped their child, took the, took the child to Cuba, um, gave the child to uh, a, a mentally um, kind of handicapped lady down there and would, would actually um, talk to his, his wife and say things like uh, that the child was dead and different things of this sort. I mean, he was, he was really, really out there with some of his thinking. And as I started to study more and more and more, the, the more I think he, he actually had, I think he probably had some sort of mental disorder. I think based on the, how prolific a writer he was, my suspicion is he may have actually been bipolar. Now I have no scientific way of, of proving that, but you know people who are in manic episodes can oftentimes be very, very high functioning if they're writing just under that man mania. And so to me, that's a lot of, of what it sounds like. He actually did some black magic cult involvement under Jack Parsons in, in California. Um, and I mean, just to show you some of his, his character, um, over and over and over, he wrote to the VA uh, asking them for more and more money for his pension uh, based on basically, you know, false claims of injury and things of that sort. Um, and was, uh, when he came out of the Navy uh, between the World War II and, and 1950, when he published um, Dianetics, was, was basically dead broke for a while. Then in May of 1950, he published Dianetics. Now, Understand, Dianetics came out at the time that there was a lot of interest in self-help or self-interest movement, right? There was a lot of these books coming out. There was a lot of concepts of, you know, trying to better yourself. And, I mean, let's face it, it, it that still goes on today. If you, if you can find a Barnes & Noble at this point, you walk in, there's an entire self-help section. Well, this is kind of the environment that he published this out of. It turns out, actually, a lot of what he published in Dianetics was actually stolen from other sources. Almost never was it actually um, cited uh, or given anyone else given credit. Um, and in fact, some of his stuff actually comes almost directly from Sigmund Freud himself. Um, and th this is actually something that was, was held by his second wife, that, uh, and it's uh, published in, in Walter Martin's book, The Kingdom of the Cults. Hubbard, a popular science fiction writer of the 1930s and 40s, made a career change by allegedly announcing at a New Jersey science fiction convention, writing for a penny a word is ridiculous. If a man really wanted to make a million dollars, the best way would be to start his own religion. And lo and behold, that's what he did. And lo and behold, he became a multi, multi-millionaire. Um, so what do they believe? Well, again, this is, you got to dig pretty hard, actually, to really understand what they believe. The first thing is they've got kind of three main concepts or prime concepts uh, about their beliefs. The first is that man is an immortal spiritual being. And part of this comes from Hubbard's teaching that the world is like 75 trillion years old. Okay? Now, just so you understand, like even the longest scientific estimates of what the universe's age is, is like 13.8 billion years. He said it's 75 trillion trillion plus years old okay and that man is and again this kind of goes back to the eastern thought that we are stuck in this kind of cycle of being an immortal spiritual being the second is man's experience extends well beyond a single lifetime sound familiar from last week the third his capabilities are unlimited even if not presently realized and that man is basically good. Well, of course, that's in complete opposition to what Christianity teaches, which is that man is sinful um, and that we are in need of a savior. Basically, scientific, Scientology's uh, concept is, is that man is good. We just have to realize how good we are. Okay? Um, now, this is, comes straight from their website, and I'm going to read it to you in case uh, it, it doesn't come across well there. But Scientology is not a dogmatic religion in which one is asked to accept anything on faith alone. That's garbage, by the way. That's my addition. Um, on the contrary, one discovers for oneself that the principles of Scientology are true by applying its principles and observing or experiencing the results. The ultimate goal of Scientology is true spiritual enlightenment and freedom for all. 
Now, Dianetics. So what was the book Dianetics about? Well, the funny thing is, Dianetics was not a book written to start a religion. He started the religion about three or four years later. Why? Because he became bankrupt. Okay? But in 1950, when he puts out Dianetics, Dianetics basically was a self-help methodology. Um, and, and the whole concept um, is that it was, it was there to help, to, to, uh, to help uh, rid people of psychosomatic disorders. It was, it was, the concept was if you could help yourself in your mental state, you could help yourself in your physical state. And that's really what um, it was uh, designed to do. That's what the whole book of Dianetics is about. Now, later writings become much different, but just the simple Dianetics, which is still the basis of the entry level into the religion, is all about self-help. And even Leah Remini and Mike Render in their series on it will talk about the fact that Somebody asked them, you know, is there any good to Scientology? And they basically said, yeah, the first couple of levels, the self-help stuff that really was kind of the basis of Dianetics is kind of good standard practice, mental health, let's get rid of bad thinking and negative thinking type of stuff. Okay, so that's really what Dianetics was all about. And it really came down to this process that they called auditing. And so what auditing basically allowed people to do was instead of having to go to some sort of psychotherapist or counselor or psychiatrist, which by the way, Hubbard absolutely detested all of those and essentially just lambasted them in much of their writing. He basically said, look, even me and you, just as friends, uh, we can get together and do this auditing process and help ourselves out. And the whole goal of it was to, quote unquote, tame the reactive mind. The reactive mind is like the emotional mind, essentially. Okay, And it, they claim that it's the source of all of our fears, all of our ailments, both physical and mental. Um, and that, that the whole concept is, is to uh, uncover it and then tame it, okay? Now again, if you know anything about kind of my, modern you know, psychotherapy type techniques, what do they, what'll they tell you to do? You, you reach in, you, under, you understand a negative thought, you understand where it comes from, and then you replace it with a new thought. So really, not all that out there type of thinking, unlike much of what we'll cover later. Um, and this all comes from basically your co-auditor hitting you with a series of questions where you are to think back into your past. And in doing these, this thinking back into your past, you are, you are eliciting what he termed engrams. Okay? Now, engrams, I'm not going to read all of this, but think of it like this. Engrams are like a movie of your past. Now, in his early writings, especially in the first book, Dianetics, these engrams were like, you know, things that had happened to you in the past. Now, what, what this particular thing, which is a quote that actually came from Scientology, talks about is the fact that when the woman gets knocked out by a blow to the face, she's rendered unconscious, she's kicked in the side, told she's a faker, she has no good, that she's always changing her mind, a chair's overturned in the process, a faucet's running in the kitchen, a car's passing in the street outside, and the engram contains a running recording of all of these perceptions. So if you, if, if you think about this now, what they're telling you is the engram's not just your memory, it's your recording, your video recording of everything that happened during that time. And if you've heard of any of the negative press about Scientology, one of the things that people have talked about is the fact that they are sometimes implanted with memories that they did not truly have. Another concept that then came later was that some of your engrams actually came from past lives. So that some of your engrams from past lives are still affecting your current life sounds a whole lot like karma that we talked about last week. This is all done with the help of an e-meter. This is a picture of an e-meter here, okay? Basically, these two tin cans have a slight voltage running through them, like super, super slight voltage, and you hold the tin cans in your hand as the auditor who sits behind uh, starts doing these questionings and trying to pull out these engrams. Sounds like telephone when you fish. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the interesting thing is that the e-meter, which is actually uh, patented by them, this 
particular style of e-meter is patented by them. It's actually a third of a lie detector test. So if you know anything about the technology behind a lie detector, it's a third of a, of a lie detector. So essentially what they were looking for was slight changes in the voltage, right, as you pull up these negative engrams, and then as you would go over it and over it and over it, the meter doesn't jump as much. And that helps you to become clear. And we'll talk about clear here in just a moment. Now, the other thing that's, that's, uh, that's talked a lot about in Scientology actually came out in this book, Science of Survival, which I believe was published in 51. Again, like I said, very prolific writer, was that this scale, this tone scale of emotions. And basically, there, were, there are ones that are given negative numbers, and that's things like you know self-hatred or anger or anxiety or homosexuality, as it turns out, was one of them on that scale. Uh, because uh, Hubbard was apparently very homophobic. Um, but then on the positive things was like happiness and joy and things of that sort. And the tone scale goes into what you're trying to accomplish in terms of the auditing. It's so complex, I don't have time to go over all of it right now. Now, the whole goal of this auditing process was to, to, to move out of the reactive mind and move into what he called the analytical mind. And when you did that, you then become clear. So people prior to, to, do, to doing that are called pre-clears. Pre-clears go through the first couple of stages. This is what Render and Remini would say is kind of the actual, like somewhat helpful part of, of Dianetics and Scientology. And then ultimately you reach clear where your analytical mind is running everything and your reactive mind is basically done away with, essentially. And their claim is, is that it not only cured neuroses and mental illnesses and things like that, but it would increase your IQ, it would in increase your alertness, it could even cure physical ailments. The kicker is, O. Ron Hubbard died after like years of being sick from chain smoking and all these other kind of things. So, you know, if he was that phenomenal, why was he ever sick? It's an interesting question that I don't quite understand why Scientologists don't ask. Um, what are the attributes of clear? I know this is very small, so I'll read some of them. This is, again, from their website directly. It says they are freed from active or potential psychosomatic illness or aberration. They're self-determined, vigorous, and persistent, unpre uh, uh, unrepressed, able to perceive, recall, uh, imagine, create, and compute at a high level above the norm. They have stable mentality. They are free with, uh, with, from emotion. Able to enjoy life, freer from accidents, healthier, able to reason uh, swiftly, and able to react quickly. And these are, these are, this is what being clear allows you to do. Okay? I mean, I'll let you make up your mind later as to whether or not that's, that's the truth. One of their other beliefs is that there are three parts of a man. There's the body, the mind, and the thetan. Now... If you're like me, what the heck's the word Thetan mean, right? Uh, so it's, it's actually that he used a, a fair amount of Greek terminology and Greek um, letters in some of his stuff, and he took the word Theta, like Beta, Theta, Pi. He took the word Theta and added an N to it. So it's a Thetan. And Thetan roughly is the soul or the spirit of a person, okay? So remember how I said one of their beliefs is that the man is a spiritual being uh, or a soul that's lived, uh, you know, in eternity, essentially. The Thetan, and I'm going to read this so that, so that you can kind of see it. The Thetan, or spirit, uses its mind as a control system between itself and the physical universe. The mind is not the brain. The brain is part of the body and does not determine intelligence. That's an interesting statement. Uh, it can be likened to a switchboard. The Thetan is the source of all creation and life itself. The exteriorization of the Thetan from its body accomplishes the realization of goals envisioned, but rarely, if ever, obtained in spiritualism, mysticism, and such fields. Recognition of the Thetan makes gains in ability and awareness possible. So essentially, the Thetan is your soul, but like more than just that. And I'll in a few minutes, I'll, I'll describe how this Thetan concept like came to be. And then there's the operating Thetan, or what is usually known as OT. So 
OT or operating Thetan is a spiritual state above clear. So remember there's pre-clears and then you get cleared and OT is levels above that. So um, by operating, uh, uh, by operating Thetan is meant uh, able to act and handle things. And by Thetan is meant the spiritual being that is the basic self. An operating Thetan then is one who can handle things without having to use a body or physical mind. Or physical means, sorry. Basic levels of Scientology help a person deal with his personal relationships and day-to-day -day problems to free his attention to address a higher aspect of existence. At the level of operating Thetan, one deals with his own immor immortality as a spiritual being. Like any other spiritual level in Scientology, the state of OT is attained by proceeding through a series of gradient steps, each one slightly more advanced than the last, and each with its own ability gained. At the level of OT, Scientologists study the very advanced materials of L. Ron Hubbard's research. According to those who have achieved OT, the spiritual benefits obtained surpass description. Now here's the kicker about all of those levels, by the way. You got to pay lots of dough to get there. By the time you get to OT level three, you've paid somewhere between ten and twenty thousand dollars to them. And one of the things Remini says in her um, in her series is that it is not uncommon for Scientologists to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars, even if they didn't have it, taking out second and third mortgages and things of that sort, just to pay for their OT levels. There are eight OT levels, by the way. So there's pre-clear, then you get to clear, then OT level one, two, three, up to eight. So OT level eight, okay? <laughs> OT three is where you start learning all of the really kooky stuff about, um, about Scientology. Now, it is said that the operating Thetan would have full control over MEST, M-E-S-T, matter, energy, space, and time. Now, if that doesn't sound like God to you, I would question what you're thinking at this point, right? If you have full control over all matter, energy, space, and time, I don't know of any other being but God that has that, okay? But this is what they promise to their adherents. And oftentimes, if someone then does start to question it, what will happen is they'll say, oh, well, you haven't done it correctly, or you haven't done it properly. Maybe you need to go back a level. And, of course, you have to pay to go back that level. And as an example, in the 1990s, David Miscavige put all of the initial training back out in a repackaged thing and essentially said, I don't care if you're OT8 or, or, or not, or anywhere below that, you have to redo all of it again. Oh, by the way, at your own cost. Okay. Now, let's talk about yes. So, when you're talking about the operating level. Yeah, the OTs. Uh -huh. So, what do they get? I mean, they get they to get control get, matter, energy, space, and time. No, I mean, do they get somebody that helps them? Ah, yeah. So, oh, so, so OT the level. Or some kind of yeah. So, until you reach clear. You are, you, you literally would sit down in a table at a, Scientology, a church of Scientology, uh, typically at a place called an ideal org, which is a, their form of a church, okay, one-on-one -on -one with an auditor. The auditor would be on the other side of the e-meter. You'd be holding the cans. And you'll, you'll hear some of the people in Remini's uh, series talk about the fact that I, will ne I won't hold the cans again. I won't hold the cans again. Because it becomes, at times, very confrontational. And they're trying to pull out memories from you and this and that and the other, okay? So you do that type of auditing at your expense until you reach clear. Once you reach clear, then OT level one and OT level, uh, sorry, OT level one is done actually on your own. Does the auditor determine that you're clear? Yes. Yes. So then OT level one is done as an independent auditing session. And it, it, these, these things are, are kind of locked up. They're not given the, the next set of material until they shell out their money and then they're given the material, right? So like you don't get the OT level one material until you've reached clear and then you pull out your pocketbook and you start writing checks. 
So then you do OT level one, and once you've reached the, the milestones there, then you would do OT level two. And at OT two, you would actually, it comes back to you have an auditor again. Um, and of course, the higher up you go, the other thing is too, the auditor has to be at a higher level too. And if you stop and think about that, that means the auditor is paid that much money to become that level. Then at OT level three, you are actually given L. Ron Hubbard's handwritten level, which is OT level three. This is where all the really weird theology stuff comes in, okay? Um, did that answer your question, by the way? Okay, so at OT level three, again, you're back to doing stuff on your own for a little while, and this is, there's actually a, a rather funny South Park episode um, about Xenu. Um, so, uh, it, I mean, it, it literally, this stuff is, I, I don't want to sound really mean about it, but if you, when you hear me tell this story, you're going to think about how laughable it is. Now, keep in mind too, what was L. Ron Hubbard before he wrote Dianetics? A science fiction writer. It comes out, okay? So, as it goes, it's a story that started 75 million years ago. Again, it's all in his own handwriting, and it's a story of the quote-unquote wall of fire. This is the one that is made fun of in the South Park episode. Basically, what happens at that time is that there is a galactic confederacy, which sounds a lot like Star Wars to me, but there's a galactic confederacy 75 million years ago that Earth is part of. There are about 75 planets that are involved in this confederacy. And in the confederacy, all of the planets are wildly overpopulated. Like, I think one of the, the numbers is like 125 trillion people on each planet on average. And I believe that at one point Hubbard actually said that there was like 220 or 250 trillion people on Earth. Now, of course, there's, there's no evidence of this whatsoever, but this is, this is what is said in these levels. Well, in order to get rid of the Confederacy, the, or sorry, get rid of the over, overpopulation problem, the Galactic Confederacy uh, elects as its leader what is actually Zemu, X-E-M-U. It gets somehow converted to Zenu, Z-E, or X-E-N-U. Um, in most popular writing, but Xenu is what I will call it, um, who is basically an evil overlord, okay? Um, it, it honestly sounds a lot like Flash Gordon from the 1980s, if you remember that movie. Um, so his plan then to get rid of the overpopulation is, is that he is going to trap all these people by tricking them uh, and put them in a deep freeze state. Then what they're going to do, what, he, what Zenu does, is he not only traps them, puts them in a deep frozen state, but he then brings them to the United States and actually dumps them in volcanoes in Hawaii. And then just to make sure, because dumping people in volcanoes isn't enough to kill them apparently, uh, not only is he going to dump them in the volcanoes, but he then drops a, uh, uh, atom bombs in there as well. Okay? Um, and what happens is that their Thetan states, their souls, start leaving out of the volcano because obviously it gets rid of their body, but the, uh, the, the soul or the, the, the Thetans start to rise up and float up into the atmosphere. But never fear, Xenu has a plan for this too. So what he does is he has these soul catchers, which basically catch all of these Thetans and uh, contain them, put them in a box. So then what he does is he takes, uh, takes them to a processing center where these Thetans are basically sat down and given these false memories, which sounds a lot like the engram, right? They're, they are just basically sat in front of a, like, a continuous stream that in, embeds in the Thetans these, all these false memories. And these false memories ultimately are what leads to the world's religions today. Okay, so this is how he says world religions are not correct because they were implanted by Xenu by giving the Thetan the incorrect false memories. These Thetans are then ultimately released on Earth. Over time, what ends up happening is, is that uh, humans start uh, populating Earth again. There's no 
indication that I can figure out how, but somehow people start uh, popping up on earth again, and the Thetans essentially, uh, which are these brainwashed souls, attach to humans. And this is then the cycle of why we have to get rid of the reactive mind and move from Thetan to operating Thetan. Clear as muddy water? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely something out of science fiction. So, if you talk to a Scientologist, what they will say is, is that their entire goal in life is to move up from, like I said, the pre-clear stage to clear and then to the operating levels on what they call the bridge to total freedom. Because if you can reach OT level 8, you're in total freedom. You're, a complete, you're, you're as complete in terms of being an operating Thetan. You've released all of your reactive mind. You are, you are cleared of all of your Thetan. Um, and you, are, you can, again, uh, you know, manipulate ma mass, energy, space, and time. I, I, they don't. They they put out a lot of numbers, none of which are anywhere remotely to accurate. So I couldn't possibly tell you. I will tell you that it's estimated there's only about thirty thousand Scientologists in the world today, truly practicing Scientologists in the world today. Was it larger than that at one point? Yes, much. Uh, it was estimated up to a million at one point in like the nineteen sixties, seventies. Um, so now. The history of the Church of Scientology gives you a lot of insight into kind of how the organization runs. So first of all, if you don't know, churches are tax-exempt entities, okay? Now, what that does to you also is not just give you tax-exempt status, meaning you do not have to pay any taxes on tithes. So say this church brought in a million dollars in, in giving uh, on Sundays, no taxes have to be paid on that, right? But it also does some other things. It protects you um, from a legal standpoint because you are considered a church entity. And because of that, because of the separation of church and state, there are certain things that you can kind of get by with. And they use that to its fullest extent. However, in 1958, they lost tax-exempt status. Why? Because in a tax-exempt organization, a single person cannot benefit financially from that giving. <clears throat> now, don't misunderstand me. Like, we're not in danger of losing our tax-exempt status because of, uh, you know, let's say we paid Pastor Todd $100,000 a year. We don't, but... <laughs> But 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 let's say but let's say for, for theoret you know theoretically we paid him a hundred thousand dollars a year to be our pastor. That's not what we're talking about. We're saying basically if you're tax exempt, you can have people on payroll and all that kind of stuff. Uh, many tax exempt entities do, but he can't direct directly benefit um, proportionally to how much money we bring in. Okay. Well, L. Ron Hubbard was directly okay it's it, it's estimated that at one point around that time he was bringing in like fifteen thousand dollars a week okay that's a lot of money especially in the 1950s so he uh lost they lost tax exempt status in 1958 now here's the kicker though they never paid any of those taxes ever in fact what actually happened was uh one of their organizations in california somehow was separate enough that it didn't lose tax-exempt status, so they actually kind of rolled everything into the California one for a while until it lost tax-exempt status as well. Um, but then, basically, Hubbard came out and said, I don't care, we're not paying taxes. And they didn't. Well, then that's called tax evasion, okay? Um, and in the late 1960s, uh, tax evasion charges were filed against L. Ron Hubbard. However, at that time, basically the way he got around that was he invented the sea organization and literally set out to sea into international waters so nobody could touch him. Okay? It is at that time that he started some of the ethics principles, or lack thereof, that the church is now very famous for. So let's talk about some of those. First of all are knowledge reports. Knowledge reports are basically reports about you doing anything in the organization that is against the organization or the teachings of L. Ron Hubbard. That's what it's meant for. 
it's basically a it, it, it's it's a it's an official policy of being a tattletale and as I understand it, if you've been in Scientology long enough, you will have a KR written against you for something. Whether that is you, you have disbelief about one of the things that they teach, or you do something incorrect, or you don't follow a, 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 a command by one of your higher ups, you'll get a knowledge report written about you. So they're kind of always living in fear of this, um, and, and they're kind of constantly snitching on each other. Okay? Now, well, ultimately, this can. So the first thing is they're oftentimes punished. Um, and you could be punished in one of many different ways. And it really depends on where you are in the organization. So if you're just kind of a normal member, probably not much is going to happen to you. But as an example, if you're a member of the Sea Org, or the, the kind of leading group, the paramilitary group, if you're a member of the Sea Org, they may make you do things like um, uh, it, it, it's, it's widely held as an example that one of the Sea Org members was made to clean the bathroom for 30 minutes, the floor of the bathroom for 30 minutes with their tongue. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Yep. What ultimately can happen if you accumulate, accumulate enough knowledge reports or KRs, you may be termed a suppressive person. So basically what a suppressive person is, is someone who basically the Church of Scientology says you're no good. Now, officially, um, a, a suppressive person is somebody uh, who is um, who basically just can't get it, doesn't understand it, isn't good enough to go through the levels of Scientology, that kind of thing. But notice some of the things that they say right on their website the suppressive person is also known as the antisocial personality they're saying that, that if you're if you're a suppressive person you actually have a mental disorder there's something wrong with you now enemies of the church are also named suppressive people so as an example leah remini mike render um, uh, shelton those guys are all considered suppressive persons Notice they also say that, you know, within this category, Napoleon, Hitler, unrepented killers, and the drug lord. I don't know who the drug lord is, but that's how it's, this is literally copied from their website. The drug lord. Th these are people that fall in the suppressive persons category. Or anyone that leaves the church of Scientology. Anyone. Here's the kicker. If you are considered a suppressive person, their policy is to disconnect you, to shun you. So basically, uh, disconnection means you have no contact with them at all. So as an example, Mike Render, formerly number two guy in all of Scientology, when he left, he's considered a suppressive person. His two sons will not speak to him, period. So leaving the cult of Scientology potentially means you are leaving behind all of your loved ones, depending on how many people happen to be in there from your life, which many of them have been in there forever. So as an example, Leah Remini, she was born into Scientology. Her parents became Scientologists. She was then born into it. So you may leave Scientology and leave all your family and friends that you've ever had in your entire life especially if you happen to be uh, a member of the Sea Org. Now, going along with that is the concept of fair game. This originally came out in 1965 by Hubbard himself. And in his words, by fair game is meant not, uh, may not be the further protected by the codes and disciplines or the rights of Scientologists. He goes on to then basically say that anything you do to them is fair game. You're asking for it. What that has taken the form of is things like former members being followed by private investigators, them going through their trash, people being uh, followed everywhere they go, being harassed, being hit with lawsuits, um, you name it. Basically, they try to destroy your life because what the Church of Scientology has essentially said back in the 1960s, Hubbard himself said, if you are subject to fair game, we have yet to find one of them that wasn't a criminal. 
Now, that's uh, it's crazy talk, of course. Now, officially, they'll say, no, that's not what fair game is. Fair game is just that you uh, aren't given the protective rights of Scientology anymore. But everyone who comes out of Scientology says, if you're subject to fair game, they'll do anything to destroy you, anything they can to destroy you. Okay? Similar. Now, uh, around this time, too, uh, Hubbard created what was called the Guardian's Office. The Guardian's Office ultimately ended up becoming, um, they, they were the ones who were doing the fair gaming aspect of things, uh, but they were actually part of one of the largest um, uh, infiltrations, if you will, of the federal government. About 5,000 Scientologists were involved in what was called Operation Snow White. What they basically were doing is they were trying to get into the IRS predominantly so that they could get dirt on the IRS and the IRS people so that they could essentially blackmail them into getting tax exempt status again. Okay? Problem is, two of them were kind of dummies. They were uh, acting as uh, janitors in the, uh, in the FBI and they got caught. And so in 1977, when these two guys get caught, it then brings about a huge investigation of the Church of Scientology. Some of you may, have, may remember this from back during those days. And ultimately, what ended up happening was in 1979, 11 Scientologists were in prison, including L. Ron Hubbard's second wife, um, because he basically threw her under the bus as a scapegoat. He was named as someone basically who was found, a, they thought was a co-conspirator, but they basically couldn't get enough dirt on him. Why? Again, because in the 1970s, he had already essentially gone into seclusion at this point. Okay? So he essentially threw his own wife under the bus, uh, along with uh, 10 other high-ranking Scientology members, in order to take the fall for something he had ordered himself. Again, at this point, this is when the Sea Org starts becoming a bigger and bigger thing. Now, at that time, there was actually three ships, and they were literally going port to port all over the world, much of which was in the Mediterranean until they started really, honestly, uh, making a lot of governments irate, and a lot of governments stopped allowing them to, uh, to, to, to board or dock there. They would spend short periods of time there and then go back out to sea uh, because, in large part, he was doing this um, to, uh, to, to essentially escape um, imprisonment and trials in a lot of different companies, including uh, uh, countries, including France. In, in building the Sea Org, the Sea Org has ranks. People above you are called sir, whether you're male or female, which doesn't quite make sense to me. Uh, teenagers uh, are, are oftentimes in the Sea Org as well. Uh, their parents essentially sign over all rights to the Sea Org, so they basically have no parental rights to them anymore. Um, and you sign a billion-year contract to serve L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology if you're in the Sea Org. A billion-year contract. Okay? You become a suppressive person. Yeah. You become a suppressed person. Yep. Um, now, it is said that in the original three ships of the Sea Org um, that there were a lot of human rights abuses, that they were not allowed to bathe or change clothes for weeks at a time. If you did anything that made R Hubbard mad, he would put you down in the bilge uh, without bathroom capabilities, all kinds of crazy stuff of that sort. Um, in fact, in the 1970s, again, France uh, charged and convicted him. Um, and uh, and then, then in 1975, uh, Hubbard actually had uh, a heart attack, uh, probably because he was a chain smoker. Um, it was also in 1975, you, may, you guys may have heard about Clearwater, Florida being uh, one of their main bases. It is what is now known as the land base. They have actually bought up most of downtown Clearwater, much to the chagrin of the uh, population of Clearwater. Um, and they actually uh, bought an entire hotel there, a huge hotel, and converted it. And many of the pictures that you see uh, of the huge Scientology building that kind of looks like a... Um, uh, parallelogram essentially it is an old hotel that they that is their their central organization 
Um, again, in, 19, in the 1980s, he went into complete seclusion and ultimately uh, ended up living out most of his life out in the West um, in essentially a, um, a, a huge compound that they had built for him. And in January 24th, 1986, Hubbard died. Up until that time, he was basically the leader of Scientology, even though officially he claimed he wasn't. He was running it literally through a group of uh, messengers um, that he had created this group of messengers that would basically bring him all the communications back. He issued the orders, written statements, and then the messengers would bring it back to the remaining uh, aspect of the Sea Org and the other people that were running the church. Then enters David Miscavige. David Miscavige was one of these messengers. Ultimately, there was a big power struggle in the early 1980s when uh, Hubbard's health was declining um, and Miscavige seized control. Uh, and he actually ousted a bunch of people from the Sea Org and the upper levels who were challenging his um, authority in there. Um, he then invented uh, several other things, uh, including in 1982, he, rebuilt, re he built the Religious Technology Center, or RTC, uh, and the Church of Spiritual Technology, the CST. Um, interestingly enough, the CST uh, is uh, an area in California. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the, the name of the place, but it's in California. Um, there is huge vaults there, uh, an underground um, uh, tunnel system and things of that sort that reportedly could withstand a nuclear holocaust. In there are um, steel tablets of all of the writings of L. Ron Hubbard etched into them so that they, would, they can be um, uh, preserved for all time and eternity, basically. Um, that's what's held in the vaults there. They also maintain six homes for L. Ron Hubbard where there are clothes laid out every single day in case he decides to reincarnate and come live in one of the six homes. These are not single wide trailers, by the way. They're enormous mansions. Um, but then in 1993, he was able to, Miscavige was, was able to regain 501c3 status for the Church of Scientology. Not only that, he was able to finagle the fact that they didn't have to pay any of those back taxes. Remember, in 58, they lost it. In 93, they gained it. They didn't pay any taxes in between there. You're talking about billions of dollars of taxes. And essentially, the story goes something like this. They had filed suit after suit after suit after suit, like, like a hundreds of suits against the IRS, basically saying that uh, the IRS was... Um, violating their rights, their First Amendment rights as freedom of, of freedom of religion. He ultimately, even that, even the U.S. government, right, can't handle thousands of lawsuits from the same group of people. So basically, Miscavige ends up talking with one of the bigwigs at the IRS, and then after about this is in '91, after about two years of investigation, where a whole lot of stuff is overlooked, basically they regain their 501c3 tax status. Which incidentally has also, remember what I said, 501c3 status not only makes you tax exempt, it also relieves you from a lot of the constraints of other laws. So they, that is how they have gotten out of several lawsuits from former members who have accused them of, of um, human rights violations. Because they basically have said, listen, this is part of our religion, you can't touch us because of separation of church and state. Okay? What do they do with all that money? They buy property. They got 12 million square feet of property in California alone. 12 million square feet, including the Celebrity Center, Gold Base, which is the Sea Org base on land. Um, now, you may have heard of the hole. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second, but that's where the hole is. They have 26 properties in California alone, which are worth over $400 million. And the CST, which is uh, in Twin Peaks, I couldn't remember it earlier, Twin Peaks, California. Now, the CST, remember, um, that is where the, the big vault is with all the steel plates. That's also where it is rumored that David Miscavige's wife, who has not been seen since 2007, is rumored to be. Now, some believe her to be dead, others believe her to be held in captivity in the CST. Uh, either way, she has not been seen since 2007 when her father died. 
This is part of what actually led Leah Remini to leave the church. She was friends with Shelley Miscavige. When Shelley Miscavige did not show up to the wedding of uh, Tom Cruise and uh, Katie Holmes, she asked where Shelly and was basically told, shut up, you don't have enough authority to ask that kind of question. And this started her on a, on a path of looking into all of the stuff. And ultimately, I believe it was in 2013 when she left the Church of Scientology very, very, very publicly. Again, they also have 68 different properties uh, in Clearwater. Uh, they have properties in many other countries, and they have a lot of what they call ideal orgs. Ideal orgs are basically their big churches. They're mostly in bigger cities around the country, uh, and almost always, almost all of them are empty all of the time. Because they have to be able to show that they're doing something with the money that's coming in. You can't just keep accumulating money and keep tax exempt status. So that's one of the things that they do. And they still do own the free wins. The free, you have to go if you want to reach OT8, you have to go to the free wins. That's the only place you can get the auditing done at your own expense, of course. Which I want to say, they, I want to say that it's like $18,000 to go to the free wins to get OT level eight, I, I think, is what it ultimately is. Um, Again, uh, one of the things that this, that this series has done is really point out a lot of the human rights violations that they have done, um, one of which has to do with uh, the, the Sea Org's uh, home base in California and that building right there, uh, which is called the Hull. Basically, if you belong to the Sea Org, uh, first of all, you're paid almost nothing you're given very small rations and essentially your life is scientology all day every day it again is a paramilitary operation they are given ranks they wear uniforms the whole night they all look like navy uniforms because he you know he, he had a navy career in the whole they have uh they have uh, different things have been described in terms of torture that that uh that especially Miscavige will do to him. Like as an example, there is a, remember we talked about being named a suppressive person and being shunned or, or disconnected. Um, there is a story where he had a bunch of people in there um, and he essentially set up a game of um, musical chairs and told them only the person who is left at the very end in the last chair will be allowed to stay in Scientology. Everyone else will be considered a suppressive person and kicked out. And so it became actually a very, very violent game of musical chairs. And ultimately, at the end of it, he said, eh, just kidding. You're all going to be able to stay anyway. He's done things in there like put people under uh, a, a, uh, um, a window unit, air conditioning unit, uh, and then throw them cold water on them for long periods of time. This is where uh, it, is, it is said that he made uh, one, one Sea Org member um, clean the bathroom floor with his tongue for 30 minutes. They are sometimes left in there for many, many, many weeks. Um, and, and when asked in one of the episodes, Mike Render was asked, you know, why would somebody from the Sea Org be put in the hole? And he goes, uh, it may just be you didn't answer a question right to Miscavige. Miscavige has also been known to come across tables to literally beat the pulp out of somebody uh, in meetings because they didn't answer correctly or you know, things of that sort. He has apparently an exceedingly violent temper um, that he will slap, cuss out, punch, kick, beat up people, throw them in the hole for no reason, for a look, for an unanswered question, for a wrong answer to a question, things of that sort. Um, there's one story that really stood out in my mind. Uh, it was a guy who was actually involved in their IT department. He was part of their uh, marketing scheme that made all these videos, um, like on the, on the websites and stuff. Um, and he ultimately was just done with it because he had gotten the pulp beat out of him a couple times by Miscavige, um, and he had a motorcycle. And he, he was stationed here because he was part of the Sea Org, um, and he escapes, right, knowing he's leaving his family behind. But he just couldn't stand anymore, so he escapes on his motorcycle. And ultimately, basically, they come after him with a van and run him off the road and basically leave him for dead. This is the kind of thing that they will, they will do to people. Um, interestingly enough, Miscavige's entire family uh, is either, it says disconnected. The reality is that Shelley Miscavige, which is the one on the bottom right, nobody knows where she is. Well, not nobody. 
There are people who know she, where she is, but most don't. But his sister has been disconnected. His brother was disconnected. His father, whom he never even called dad, he only called Ron, who wrote a, a book which I'm actually very interested to read, have not read yet, and his niece have all been disconnected. He carry, he's the only one that carries the, the rank of captain um, in the Sea Org, which at this point is now the highest rank in the Sea Org. Um, yeah. Any questions? I threw what probably could be a 10-part series easily. Well, I mean, Leah Remini's is a three-series-long three uh, thing. I highly encourage you to watch it. It's heartbreaking, honestly. It really is. It's on, uh, it's on Netflix, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah Netflix. Um, three seasons of it. It's fascinating. Well, like, would the, would the wife miss it? Yes. I mean, can authorities not? I mean, uh, well, so officially, Scientology's claim is, is that she is working uh, at deep levels of the Scientology church uh, at the CST, and they can't, I mean, they, they can't, they have to have evidence that she's actually either been killed or, you know, whatever, but they are such a secretive group, they can't, they can't get enough evidence to actually, um, to, to do that, yeah. They uh, also, like, if you are a member, your kids have to go to their school, and they're all boarding schools. Mm -hmm. if you don't, your children aren't raised in your house. You turn your kids over to them, and they raise your children inside of their schools to teach them whatever, which is where most of their Sea Org uh, personnel comes from. Mm -hmm. They raise them up in it as mm -hmm. children and then turn them over. There's so, rampant sexual abuse, sexual assault that goes on in yeah. there as well. So, like, I'm, I'm part of it. Yeah, it depends on where you are. So they have normal members that are that you know go to these ideal orgs and go through the auditing process and all that kind of stuff. Um, for the most part, those people don't um, you know sustain the types of abuse that like Sea Org members and and those types of folks do. Um, but at this point. That's the portion that's dwindling is the just regular members portion. Yeah. But like that compound of whatever with a higher legal. I mean, if I want to leave and go to the store, am I allowed to leave and go to the store? No. So you're like, that guy. Correct. <laughs> like as an example, the people, some of the stories that get told about how folks leave and stuff is that, you know, they're, some of them obviously at some point do have to leave to go to stores and stuff like that. Um, but they, what they would do is they'd ultimately plan, okay, the guards know I'm, I'm always going on this errand, so they would just they'd go on that errand every week and then just leave from the store and just never come back in order to, to escape detection. And many of them are tracked down, and that, that's the thing. Well, what draws your celebrity population to this? Well, of celebrities in this, correct. So first of all, they cater to celebrities specifically. Because they they know that that carries weight with it. Um, second of all, um, they if you stop and think about the concept of Scientology, that if you reach OT level, then you can you know you can uh, manipulate mass, energy, space, and time. Uh, I don't know of any group that has a bigger ego than those in 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 Hollywood, and so I think it it feeds into their ego of look what you can do you can you know you can manipulate mass energy space and time uh, so i think i think the combination of those two things yeah so is the guy that's in charge he's shown that he can do this stuff david miscavige yeah no <laughs> well, that's what i'm wondering i mean you know <laughs> no so no of course not yeah, it's. I mean, when it's a it's a brainwashing, destructive cult. You figure that right there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. But, but what, one of the things. So so that question does get asked in that series, Remini series, is like, well, well, why do people stay in it? And one of the things is, look, you by the time you get to those levels and you realize that these guys aren't what they are, you've paid hundreds of thousands of dollars. Your whole family is in there. 
And you know that if you get termed a suppressive person, if your son, as an example, doesn't believe that Scientology is corrupt and stays in Scientology, you're going you're gonna to lose your son or your daughter or your mom or your dad or your spouse. And so it's, it's, it's like any other cult where there's seductive things to get you in and the lower level milk that they give you isn't, doesn't look bad. Again, it, it looks a lot like a lot of counseling you know, measures. But then you pay more, so they got you, they got you on the hook for a little more money, you know, and then you pay a little bit more because you get promised more, and then ultimately by the time you got there, you're, you're hook, line, and sinker. Yes, ma'am. Let me tell you something. They take that information and they put it in their mouth. Yeah, that's a, <coughs> that's a great point. <coughs> I didn't bring that up. You're absolutely right. That's the other thing they do is they, they will blackmail them because many of these, you know, engrams that people come up with their memories, a lot of them are people's real memories. And so they'll, they'll, they will, they'll record what you've said. And then if you, you know, start talking bad about the church, they'll say, uh, wait a minute, we got some dirt on you. So that's another tactic they use as well. All right. Well, we, Gotta get over to the business meeting. Thanks, y'all. I appreciate everything y'all are doing.